going to read the beginning of There's Be the Power by Caldale, University of Illinois Press. There's Be the Power, Caldale, University of Illinois Press. Right. So, there's Be the Power. Henry M. Caldell, there's Be the Power, the Moguls of Eastern Kentucky. The Moguls. So, the rich Moguls. <laughs> the wealthy, uber wealthy, rich Moguls. So, there, there are rich people in Eastern Kentucky. Most people in Eastern Kentucky are not rich, but there are some. Introduction. Eastern Kentucky has been much in the news for a long time and for many reasons. It's 13,302 square miles of rugged mountains, low razorback hills, and narrow valleys are part of the Appalachians, and Americans have demonstrated a prolonged fascination with the land and the people of the southern and central portions of that ancient range. Reams of paper and torrents of ink have been expended on the quaint people of the Kentucky Highlands. They first caught the attention of the nation during the Civil War when their isolated society was shattered by marching armies and ferocious partisanship. There were a f there were few neutrals in the hills after Fort Sumter, in which many county uh, many county civil government dissolved. Um, so, and the big war, war led to innumerable, innumerable little ones, which were chronicled as feuds. Here's a picture to show the Eastern Kentucky that we're talking about. So, uh, you know, there's lots of definitions for Eastern Kentucky. Some of them would have counted uh, some of your Boyd County and Greenup County, but that's uh, that's more southeastern Kentucky uh, than anything. So. In the 1890s, local color riders began making their way along the atrocious trails that passed for roads and described their finds in scores of articles. One of the first of these gentry, Will Wallace Harney, gave the region a label that has endured in the popular mind, a strange land and a peculiar people. The string of appellations, appellations grew in the half century that followed. The hill people are described as picturesque, quaint, primitive, suspicious, Narrow-minded, ignorant, and of low mentality. But not all writers were detractors. Some found the mountaineers to be brave, chivalrous, noble, generous, free-spirited, splendid Anglo-Saxons, and guardians and preservers of our British heritage. Most often, the Highland people have attracted the nation's attention because of tragedy and misfortune, as when the region is lashed by a deadly flood or a coal mine explosion, devastates a community, or a labor struggle convulses a coal field. Sometimes the newspaper are attracted by malign conditions that appear especially stark when seen amid the sober hills, somber hills. In the heyday of the mid-1960s Great Society, reporters trekked into uh, the eastern Kentucky outback to photograph poetry, poverty, and squalor. When poverty lost its vogue and environmentalism became the grand new cause, it returned to capture the spectacle of strip mine mountains and sulfur silt choked trash strewn streams. In 1793, when the Arabs embargoed oil shipments to the United States and coal prices on the spot market rose by as much as 700% in a single year, the media pilgrims came to tell the tale of paupers turned into princes. Instant millionaires explained to all and sundry how they had acquired fortunes and retired or moved out of the hills to become bankers and horse breeders. In due time, the coal boom dissolved and the cameramen reappeared, this time to relate the tale of woe caused by a coal glut in the midst of an oft-proclaimed energy crisis. The published story of eastern Kentucky has been one of almost unrelieved gloom. Despite periodic fuel shortages and the resulting booms, the people remain poor. Though the 1970s saw Kentucky surpass West Virginia to become the nation's largest coal producer, mountain people shared only minimal, minimally in the prosperity. In 1976, the state ranked 44th in per capita income, and the five poorest counties in America were in the Kentucky Hills. And one of them, Owsley, 
2,565 of the 5,200 inhabitants received food stamps, and 62% of its population lived below the federally determined poverty level. And the most prosperous county, Pike, which during the coal boom of 1973-75 had been hailed as a little Saudi Arabia of coal. So Pike County is a little Saudi Arabia of coal in the 70s. Percent of the residents, 23% of the residents were receiving various forms of welfare. So, even Pike County, the little Saudi Arabia of coal, one-fourth Pike Countyans were in welfare. Numerous costly federal rescue programs in a period of high coal prices had strewn the narrow valleys, with new mobile homes clogged the county seats with large and expensive cars, financed several hundred impressive residences, but changed little else. The schools were still dreary and underfinanced, taxes on the Extract of coal, oil, gas, and quarrying industries remained at trifling levels. Entire counties with large coal industries lacked any kind of hospital facilities. Public health was dismal. It was estimated that half of the people had intestinal worms, and the region was plagued with extremely high rates of heart disease, epilepsy, diabetes, and depression. Psychiatrists coined a new term, the Eastern Kentucky Syndrome, for a chronically depressed and passive state of mind which they averred to be totally dis disabling. Yeah, half the people had intestinal worms. Plagued with extreme high rates of heart disease, ap the epilepsy, diabetes, depression. Come on, Eastern Kentucky. Come on, Eastern Kentucky. Amid this wealth of economic and social chaos of poverty, passivity, and dependence, there is another and little-known world of prosperity, ease, and power. This was the world of the coal barons, the people who owned the fabulous mineral, mineral riches of Appalachian, Kentucky, for more than 15 years. Segments of the press have struggled to reveal this world of Appalachian opulence amid Appalachian destitution. In April 1965, Dunn's Review, an investment magazine, described the startling prosperity of the eastern Kentucky mineral industries, pointing out that the nation's most profitable investor-owned corporations were obscure eastern Kentucky land companies. Four months later, the Louisville Courier Journal described Kentucky's primitive system of tax assessment and collection. The tax commissioners were shown to have only the scantest knowledge of local mineral wealth. They were not aware of how many acres the land corporations owned or of the quality or quantity of the underlying coal, oil, and gas deposits. The writer Kyle Vance showed with great clarity that while the mineral industries were generating a flood of profit, the state was receiving the merest trickle of taxes. A year later, James C. Millstone explored this paradox of poverty amid riches and two powerful articles in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He detailed the curious fact that in an impoverished eastern Kentucky where federal dollars were being enlisted in a world of poverty, gigantic and immensely profitable corporations were escaping almost untaxed, thereby assuring more poverty. In short, the rich were in total and unchallenged control of the Appalachian coal fields. The region and its people had been and were being exploited in a manner that might have reddened the cheeks of Attila the Hun. The valleys were strewn with rotting coal camps, which their builders had abandoned after mechanization of the mines in the 1950s, eliminated the need for hand labor. The low taxes on mineral resources held schools, courts, law enforcement, and public health services to minimal levels. Trash disposal consisted of throwing unwanted refuse in the streams. Public officials at all levels fawned over the middle industrialists while pitching welfare crumbs to the swarming paupers. Such a medieval situation. So the serfs, right, the serfs and the, um, uh, the nobles, right, the serfs and the landowners, the landlords and the lords and serfs. Public officials at all levels fawned over the mineral industrialists while pitching welfare crumbs to the swarming paupers. Such a medieval situation, unthinkable elsewhere among advanced nations, raises the serious possibility that it was all brought about deliberately by the region's landlords in their single-minded pursuit of profits. At least one Kentucky politician had the courage to attack the problem head-on. In 1923, Alvin Barkley sought the Democratic gubernatorial nomination, promising to levy a percentage tax on minerals severed. Alvin Barkley. Okay, so that's a hero. That's a hero. That's a Howard Zinn says we gotta find heroes in our history books, and Alvin Barkley is a hero. So is Willis Russell of Owen County, Kentucky, a rebel in rebel country. Willis Russell killed lots of the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK tried to take over after uh, Kentucky won the Civil War since we were a part of the Union, right? 
So, Alvin Barkley sought the Democratic gubernatorial nomination. He castigated the coal moguls before scores of audience. You can't get a school bill through the legislature without going to the coal lobby for their consent. If you want a road past the schoolhouse, you must see them. I propose to take the filthy hands of the coal combine from the throat of Kentucky. <laughs> Barkley, an accomplished politician and a powerful orator, later became the U.S. Senate Majority Leader and Harry Truman's Vice President, but he never became Governor of Kentucky. I like that quote, actually. You can't get a school bill through the legislature without going to the coal lobby for their consent. If you want a road past the schoolhouse, you must see them. I propose to take the filthy hands of the coal combine from the throat of Kentucky. <laughs> So he became uh, never governor, uh, Harry Truman's vice president. So uh, we had a vice president come out of Kentucky, Harry Truman's. The cold combine rallied its forces around him, against him. So just like uh, William Justice Goble had 23 years earlier, Alvin Barkley did again. The great landowning corporations and their leaseholding operators, the steel corporations, the oil and gas companies, the railroad and pipeline companies, the barge companies, and the electric utilities formed a militant an invincible phalanx. As two insightful politicians, Jesse Unruh and Lyndon Johnson, would later remind us, money is the mother's milk of politics. In 1929, the economic muscle was braced solidly against Barclay. His defeat taught him a lesson which he expressed in a private conversation 30 years later. You can't win elections on issues. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, LBJ, Jesse Unruh said money is the mother's milk of politics, 1929, economic muscle, uh, crushed Alvin Barkley, so he basically said you can't win an election on issues, you know, you got to have the money if you want to win an election. In the sixth decade since Barkley's defeat, billions of tons of Kentucky coal and most of the oil in the state's shallow deposits have been extracted. The state continues to be an important producer of natural gas. Billions of tons of coal remain in the hills, and prominent oil geologists have written that vast deposits of petroleum lie deep under the Appalachian Overfold Valley and the adjacent plateaus. Oil companies have moved in, buying huge acreages and leasing much more. The coal industry is changing as coal companies become subsidiaries of petroleum companies. The filthy hands of the combine have become larger and stronger, and their grip on the state's throat grows more oppressive. The primary purpose of this book is not to analyze Kentucky's economic and political problems or to propose solutions to them. The library shelves are already replete with such studies. My aim is to explore a fascinating period in the state's history from a perspective that historians have consistently ignored. I seek to remove the shadows of obscurity from the names and works of a generation of industrial moguls who transformed a remote and impoverished hinterland into the nation's most productive coal field. They turned a backwoods people, the Kentucky hillbillies, into industrial workers, removing thousands of them from their tiny farms and mountain coves and resettling them in a few solid, well-planned towns and in many scabrous camps that were hideous slums from the beginning. I shall discuss the legacy of economic and political power that has come down to us from those times and how it affects the present generations of Kentuckians. The word mogul has been chosen deliberately because the dictionary assigns it a meaning that is precisely fits those dead and vanished industrialists. A rich and powerful man is a mogul. The men who industrialized the hundreds of valleys in Appalachian Kentucky were indeed both rich and powerful. They were men of enterprise, goodly of girth, and the gold chains that gleamed across their chest secured costly many jeweled watches. They lived in regal mansions and in those days before the corporate jet traveled and immaculately kept private railroad cars. They ate the best foods and stocked their cellars with superb, superb champagnes and costly vintage wines. Their walls were bedeckled with diplomas from good colleges and their sons and daughters studied at prestigious campuses. Their frequent trips to Europe were taken amid the luxuries of ocean liners. When business called them from their baronial halls, they relaxed in hotel suites. They knew presidents, congressmen, governors, and could open doors to the innermost sanctums of power. Many of them combined business with political office and were called governor, senator, or congressman in their own right. They were intended to be the best physicians, counseled by the wisest lawyers. They collected corporate director ships by the dozens. Most of them were bankers and manipulated the aggregate funds of entire communities, sometimes in broad regions. Some of them were almost scandalously intermarried to kinswomen. 
their progeny invariably found spouses among the offspring of other moguls. And on and, and on and on. I see. A couple more pages, but uh, are some really good stuff. The introduction is very powerful. There's Be the Power uh, by Caldell. Check it out. Eastern Kentucky. It's your people. Learn about your people, Eastern Kentucky.